Um, so we're going to do just a little bit more on kind of the business side, and hopefully we still have a little bit of time to go uh, to some technical things. Um, so, so we kind of touched just briefly when we were sitting up here about kind of the, the role of wireless and fiber and stuff. And, and I just kind of like to get your opinions on, well, I guess, what percentage of your network is fixed wireless today? What do you think it's going to be in the future? And do you think you're going to continue with large sites feeding many customers or try to go deeper in the neighborhoods and do shorter ranges? H how do you see this playing out for fixed wireless and other access technologies in your business? I think we're 90% wireless today with the rest of it being a mix of fiber and, and cable. Um, I think obviously the end game for, I know, I know Brian would agree, it's fiber. You know, if we could get fiber to the customer, then that's ultimately the best thing. However, takes a long time and we can deploy wireless now. Um, and I think for us, pushing that mini pop model, to 60 gigahertz and leveraging as much of the technologies that are out there today um, as possible is where I see us going and, and pushing the millimeter wave as far as you can with some kind of a backup for it and the integrated solutions that, that make that seamless transition between millimeter wave and, and uh, you know, some kind of uh, backup band, whether that's licensed or not is really the future, and that's where we're going, is, is it's not easy for us to always build fiber somewhere, but I can always put in a wireless link, generally. So I want to stretch that as far as I can. So when you say mini pop, like how, how many customers would you, are you thinking it's serving when you say that? And, um, and what range? Oh, distance? Yeah. Uh, less than two miles. Okay. Yeah, I mean, okay. uh, half a mile to two miles, yeah. That's uh, just a pop. <laughs> so that's, that's the difference, Texas, right? So. We got a lot of land mass, okay? <laughs> Don't say that to the Alaska guys, though, because there's what, three Texas? There's like three of them here, so. <laughs> Um, we're 100% fixed wireless today, and I don't think fiber is a bad thing. I think it's a very expensive thing yeah. in rural areas. So, um, you know, if we were going to go cover a town, 100% coverage, you know, 10,000, 20,000 homes or something, we'd probably want to do fiber because your cost per home pass is much lower. Um, you know, wireless has cases in towns like that too. Um, but right now we're fixed wireless. That's where we're, where we're going to stay. But we are trying to get closer to the customer, right? Micro pops, like under five miles, instead of doing those nine mile shots. Or we want to go to five, and then in town we want to do you know the half mile shots. You know what we try, call a true micro pop, a rooftop site, 20 feet high. You're only going to go that half mile range if that. Um, so that's what we're going towards right now. And joint, you're a hybrid basically. Yeah. yeah so uh, so we're a Wisp and a FISP and an MSP. Um, so from subscriber count, uh, by far we have more fixed wireless subscribers. Uh, from revenue, we're about neck and neck. Um, but once you layer on some additional services that we feel comfortable offering on fiber that we don't on fixed wireless, um, voice, uh, hosted servers, things like that, it starts um, skewing pretty hard towards um, you know traditional wireline business. Um, in five years, we will still be heavy and fixed wireless. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that's assuming the big three can't really get it together and deploy 5G in an efficient and complete <laughs> manner uh, and make it work um, outside of urban centers. And I, I think that's probably a fairly safe bet mm -hmm. because I, you know, again, I've been around a long time, so I, I heard how uh, broadband over power line was going to put us out of business, you know, 15 years ago, and then I heard how 4G would put us out of business, you know, 10 years ago. So uh, uh, we still keep plugging along. So uh, we will continue to do fiber deeper into the network, but there, are, there are areas that, um, you know, fiber to the premise will never, never make sense. And you got a guy that has a mile-long driveway um, back through the woods or through his uh, farm. Uh, unless he wants to write the check for that construction, which is exceptionally rare, uh, there's no way that you're going to make that back on a residential opportunity. Um, our running average for, you know, underground construction and the way that we build it's about 75k a mile. So, um, you know, you got to have a whole lot of $79 accounts <laughs> uh, <coughs> to see any kind of ROI. Did you say it was about 75,000. 75, okay, um, so we are getting a little bit towards the end here. So I'm going to toggle over to a, a little bit of technical stuff. I'm just going to kind of jump to the some that I think are maybe the more interesting questions. But 
if you had to do one, so technical, not business now, if you had to think about the biggest mistake you made designing or deploying your network, a technology choice, um, an architectural choice, whatever those things are, uh, what, were your, what are your biggest mistakes and what would you undo if you could? Thinking too small. It was the hardest thing for us. We, we, we didn't start with any capital, so we didn't have any money to, to buy you know, whatever we really needed, and we just grew, and then we had to change and upgrade, and grew and had to change and upgrade, grew and had to change and upgrade, which is an awesome problem to have, but it sometimes leads to a poor experience for the customer, and I'll admit it. I mean, we had our fair share of, oh, you know, this is overloaded this or that, and you know, if I could start all over again and somebody could hand me a half a million dollars, I'd have done things a lot different, but we didn't start that way, so. Um, I like that we started kind of at a, from a pure place, but at the same time, um, I know we, we probably, you know, affected our reputation to some extent because of the choices we had to make because of the, the lack of funding we had. Uh, for us, about seven and a half years ago we started, so um, probably our biggest thing was buying cheap tower enclosures that weren't <laughs> sealed properly. So in Minnesota we'd like end up getting snow in the boxes. Ooh. You know, we thought they were sealed, like truck boxes, like toolbox things. They're like, oh, yeah, there's little seals around them. You know, that's great. But when the wind, you know, when they're up in the air and the wind goes underneath them, pops them open enough for snow to blow in, we go up there and the, everything's tripped and there's like a foot of snow in the box. So I'd say for us, buying cheap tower enclosures, even though they weren't enclosures, was probably our biggest mistake. And then really cheap battery backups. Um, you know, we just buy like a $60 UPS or something, which would give you 40 minutes to back up. Uh, we've gone since then done like all DC power in all our sites and one it's way more stable because it, it's never grid power feeding your equipment it's always stable you know 12 or 24 volt DC so everything doesn't have these weird power blips when the grid has an under voltage condition and things like that so yeah for us battery backup and tower enclosures is it limited to technology no. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, not, whatever you like. Not reading people <laughs> fast enough. And so back to, you know, Adair's uh, comment about um, brand reputation and, and being able to repair that. Um, we've had a lot of bad employees uh, and didn't have the right monitoring tools and, and checks and balances. So, uh, you, you know, you have somebody that... Uh, goes out and throws up a complete garbage install in December um, just to um, tick the box that it was done and, and then the customer has problems and you know if you only have a couple installers that same guy may be getting sent back over and over to the job and he's not gonna say oh yeah I did a terrible job every <laughs> single time I've been here man this is, this is awful and so um, uh, Eventually, and, and we've tried to run QC with others in-house that were um, maybe uh, a little bit cheaper per hour to do the QC, but uh, maybe they also weren't as particular, uh, or they're buddies with the guys because they go out drinking all the weekend, right? So they don't really want to say, hey, Dare, what were you thinking yesterday <laughs> at, this, at this install? Uh, and... Uh, Eventually, I just got frustrated with the problem, so now I do the QC, uh, or uh, partner in crime, Daniel, who uh, is at home taking care of the network now, um, he'll do QC, and so uh, it helps that they know that it will be looked at. There's a, there's a high probability. We don't look at every single job uh, in person. Uh, we do look at every single job at this point via photos, so I require a minimum of three photos at every new install require photos at service calls so that I can say, well, I understand you didn't install this. It was installed five years ago, but that's a piece of crap. Let's go fix it. And, and you know, I've empowered them to, if you're there at a job and you've got an hour to do it, and an hour is completely unacceptable amount of time to, to make it right, uh, it is your job to get the customer service working and then to make sure that scheduling knows that we have to go back for you know, four hours. I don't, I don't care what time it takes to make it right, just fix it. make it right. Mm -hmm. So if that's a post in the yard, installed on the other side of the house, uh, or, if, or if the right answer is, sorry, we can't service you, that is the right answer. Um, because they, they will be pretty upset when you tell them that, especially if they don't have other options. 
Um, but they will be upset for perpetuity if you continue to provide bad service. And so your, your reputation is, is that you provide crap service, they're gonna tell everybody at work how terrible it is. Eventually they will forget how bad their service was with you know, Joink when they don't have it. <laughs> so they can, they can be frustrated with poor cellular, poor satellite, or any other poor choice other than our poor service isn't available because we want it to either be great or we don't want to talk to you. Yeah. And, and so uh, and that, that's a decision that I definitely would have pulled back of being too nice and, hey, I really want to help you out. Uh, I know, I know, you, you know, your kids can't do homework. You got to go to McDonald's, and oh, you, I understand. You promise, you promise, you will never call and <laughs> complain because you know that the signal isn't there, right? I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard that, right? Oh, I understand. Just anything, anything you can do for me, sir, please. Four megabits, that would be wonderful. And it's, uh, yeah, have those, you know, right? sometimes you make it a couple months, but uh, not likely. Okay, uh, so we're just about out of time. Uh, we have maybe like five minutes left. So, 10 minutes left, okay. So I have a couple more questions, but before, I do, does anybody else have any questions or, or topic areas you'd like to dive into? <laughs> One at the back there. You must be in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so just to, to repeat that for the, the benefit of the recording. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, so the comment was about using drones to, to identify where you can deliver service first. And then how the yeah. tower goes and, and, and how tall you have to be in the tower. And stuff. Yeah. yeah, there's a company here in the show that, that builds drones for that purpose. That's all their signs the other day. Okay, yep, yeah, go ahead. You're standing here in four ways. Okay. Question about buying new, buying used vehicles. Yep. Branding on the vehicles. Yep. Um, for us, we've always, we've just we will t t typically buy a used vehicle. I've got a, a guy locally who turns over trucks from you know the gas company, electric company, whatever. They're well maintained. They 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 turn them over at pr pretty early mileage. I know there's a lot of argument you could have back and forth between just buying a new vehicle and leasing it and not having the maintenance on it. Um, I think it's about six what half a dozen the other. We've kind of ran the numbers both ways, uh, but brand, we brand everything. I want everybody to know where, who I am, where I am, um, all the time. Yeah, obviously brand vehicles. Um, we've only bought new though. Um, I'll say Dodge is the worst. Minnesota Wi-Fi money. <laughs> yes, D Dodge, Jeep, Christ, just avoid those brands. I'm sorry if you own one, they are horse crap, okay? Um, we had two Dodge vans uh, for three and a half years. They had 38,000 miles and 47,000. They were both in the shop 60 days each for like seven different visits. So 120 days between the two vans. Worst vans ever, we finally got rid of them, thank God. Um, and so now we've had, we have like a Nissan NV 2500, like a big van, gets horrible mileage, but it should be reliable, so we're, we're happy about yeah, that. Yeah, we only buy pickup trucks anymore. Yeah, Chevy, right? That's yeah, well, Ford and Chevy, yeah. Ford, okay, I'm not a Ford fan, but that's still yeah, better than either. Dodge. I'm not still better than Dodge. Title, so. <laughs> uh, it depends. So, um, sometimes the cheapest thing you buy is the most expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't, what's the saying, uh, penny wise, pound foolish or something, yeah. right? So, um, what we have done, we buy for our w fixed wireless guys, we buy new Nissans. They come with a five year, 100,000 mile warranty. So, in theory, other than something that we caused uh, from, you know, being idiots, uh, <laughs> or just wear and tear items, it should be a zero dollar cost. So. Uh, so far, that's worked out. Uh, we're in our first round uh, next year of replacing those. Um, but y it helps to know what kind of mileage you drive. So like Adair's network, uh, you know, it's four times the area of mine. Uh, we're averaging around 20K per vehicle per year. Well, 20K times five, that's about 100K. That's the bulk of my analysis. Um, because we did previously buy a lot of used gear and um, you know, oftentimes you're putting 
thousand uh, bucks, fifteen hundred bucks in it yeah. fairly soon after. I mean, ball joints stuff, not because it was misused or mistreated. Wear item. They're just a wear item. And so if you're having to put new wear items in uh, within the first year or two and you know, labor rates keep going up, shops are charging more and more. Uh, before long, the, the cost of just buying new helps. Um, for our heavy equipment, we buy almost exclusively used. I can't think of anything on our fiber crew, um, vehicle-wise, uh, road DOT-wise, uh, that was bought new. Uh, we've got a few new drills, uh, but we started with used. Uh, our theory was our guys can tear up something with faded paint just as easy as the shiny <laughs> stuff. 100% uh, guarantee that that is factually true. Uh, <laughs> and they usually don't give you warranties on those type. Of the heavy equipment, when it breaks, it's usually not a wear item or a warranty item. It is more commonly uh, operator user. Error. <laughs> yes, that is that is the generous uh, way yeah. to describe it. Operator yeah. error. Okay. Uh, uh, so we got just a, a couple minutes left. Um, I guess one final question: if, if you had a magical wand and you could solve one technical problem by waving it today, somewhere in your network, in the core network, in the access network, wow, what would be that one thing you wish you could solve, or someone else would solve for you? Talent pool, fiber. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I don't have a quick answer like these days. <laughs> Abracadabra. Uh, quadruple access point capacity. There we go. That's, that's our biggest problem is last mile. So.